Welcome to the second lecture covering Chapter 11 of our textbook. As you likely know, this topic is capacity and legality. In the first lecture on this chapter, we covered the topic of capacity. So naturally, our second topic is going to be the topic of legality. But I'm going to do just a little bit of a refresher so we can all be on the same page, metaphorically speaking, when we're talking about this topic. Here we go. I don't know what exactly happened there. Here we go. Okay, so we have our four elements of contract law. We've discussed agreement in Chapter 9. We discussed consideration in Chapter 10. And in Chapter 11, we're talking about the last two requirements, which is capacity and legal object. But before we go too far down that road, let's look at our um, kind of cheat sheet. Um... Here we go. It's not the one I wanted. Here we go. Let me just go ahead and pull it up from a different resource. Okay, here we go. So, when we were last together, we had kind of built our uh, uh, kind of float, not flow chart, but our, uh, our uh, outline of contract formation this way. We talked about agreements and, ex uh, and the two elements of agreement, which is offer and acceptance. We talked about consideration and we talked about the nine uh, rules of consideration. We talked about contractual capacity and we talked about the three categories that can uh, cause contractual capacity not to be in play. Uh, someone being in their minority, somebody being incompetent. Uh, we'll call this mentally incompetent. A mentally or intellectually competent person and also being an intoxicated person. So this is going to be our last element of contracts. This is what we're going to be exploring today. So I'm going to fast forward to halfway through the lecture and here we go. So we've covered agreement, consideration, and capacity, and now we're ready for a legal object. Okay, so obviously a contract has to, be, has to be lawful in order for it to be enforceable by a court. I mean, that's just common sense. If I were a drug dealer and you were my client and I wanted to sell you heroin and something went awry with our deal, neither you nor I would think, hmm, maybe I ought to file a lawsuit wouldn't occur to us because we would realize a court's not going to enforce it. It's a pretty obvious idea, not one that you have to do a lot of thinking about, that you would need to have um, a, a legal basis for the contract in order to be able to enforce it. There are actually two elements, though, to this idea of the contract being legal. The first, it has to have a legal exchange as its subject. In my example, um, uh, the, the, the legal object or the illegal object was heroin. So the subject of the uh, contract was heroin usage. So that would make it unlawful. But let's imagine a different scenario. Sometimes something can have a legal object as its subject or legal exchange as its subject, but it also needs to be performed legally. Um, so imagine that um, uh, you, I, uh, or I, uh, you, you come to me and you want to buy the car that I'm using right now. Um, perfectly lawful transaction there. It ends up that I tell you that I actually stole this car, that I don't actually own this car. Um, while the, the, it is perfectly lawful for somebody to buy a car, uh, that's a lawful subject matter. Uh, under these circumstances, it would be, we'd be unable to perform this transaction legally because I don't actually own the car. Another example, perfectly lawful to buy and sell kegs of beer, but it's not perfectly lawful to buy and sell those 
to somebody under the age of 21. In that case, we actually have somebody, we'll say somebody who's 20 years old, who is who has attained his majority, so he does he lacks the capacity, he excuse me, he has the capacity to contract, but he does not have the legal right to con to enter into this particular type of contract. Usually, if either one of these items are missing, or sometimes both of them are missing, uh, the contract will be declared void as if it never existed. And the court won't even get involved in kind of sorting through or returning the parties to the original status that they were in. There's some exceptions to this rule, and we'll talk about those in more detail. But most of the time, the court will say, you know what? You're both guilty in this situation. And so, we're not even going to figure out, well, you ought to give this back and you ought to keep this. We're not even going to go there. You shouldn't have done this. You're both guilty. You're stuck with wherever you, you landed in this particular matter. So we've said that a contract has to, or that a contract has to have a legal object. But what do we mean when we're talking about a legal object? What do we mean by this term? Our first thought might be, or at least my first thought would be, well, let's find a statute or at least a case law that's going to tell us what uh, the law is. It might be a state law. It might be a federal law. It might even be a local ordinance. Um, but uh, that's where we're going to find the law. For example, going back to the idea of uh, the, the beer keg that um, uh, I want to sell, well, we would go to the... Um, uh, the code in Texas, the alcohol code, and find out what are the rules about selling alcohol to people under the age of 18. There's a statute that answers this question. We don't need to have a question mark in our head. Well, what does the rule say? Well, the rule's pretty darn clear. And so we can look to a statute or to either at the state level or the federal level. This is where most of the activity is going to be. But it's possible that we will have something that isn't codified into a statute. It may even be something that the court system hasn't yet addressed. And now we're looking at public policy. Let me give you an example. This is going to date me a little bit, but when I was in law school, that was from 87 to 90, there was a big issue that was kind of front and center in our culture at that time. And in that situation, there was, um, the, 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 the case was called, uh, the, the case of baby M, or I can't remember, but anyway, the, the letter M was used. Um, instead of giving the child's name, the, the letter M was used instead of her name. Anyway, what the situation was is there was this man and this husband and wife, and the wife had a serious health issue. It wasn't so much terminal, but it was a chronic problem like rheumatoid arthritis or multiple sclerosis or something like that. Anyway, it was sufficiently serious that it was not medically appropriate for her to uh, carry a child, have a child, bear a child um, because of her particular medical situation. Um, the husband was uh, the sole surviving family member uh, of this particular family. He was of the Jewish faith and most of his family had died in the Holocaust. The few members of his family who had survived had, uh, you know, petered out over time, and he was it. He was the last person to bear his surname, and it was really important to him uh, to have a biological child so that he could continue his family, um, uh, you know, name and, and the family connection uh, going forward. And so they were at this this difficulty. Wife couldn't have a child but he very much wanted to have a biological child, not just an adopted child. So what they decided to do was to hire a woman to uh, carry their child. Back in the 1980s, the technology hadn't advanced to the point that they could take an egg from the wife, and fertilize it in a Petri dish, and then implant it into the uterus of this surrogate uh, mother. Uh, at this time, what was required was that um, the surrogate mother actually used her own egg. I don't remember if they uh, extracted an egg and uh, 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 fertilized the egg in a Petri dish or if they actually um, caused the conception to occur in her uterus. I don't remember the specifics, but certainly... Um, the surrogate mother and the husband did not have, did not conceive the child the old-fashioned way. We'll just put it that way. Um, anyway, so 
the the woman who became the surrogate mother had was married and she had had already had biological children she had gone through the childbirth process the, the all that process and so she knew what was involved in the process both on a physical level and an emotional level so she uh, agrees to this and she's doing it primarily for financial reasons the family doesn't have a lot of financial assets and this would really help them make ends meet um, I think she may have also had sympathy for the situation that this particular family that she was assisting was in and so that might have played some role anyway she becomes pregnant she carries the child um, but as the pregnancy progresses and especially at the time of delivery she starts having a second thoughts is it really right to give up this child who is my biological child is this family who's going to adopt my biological child really the best place for this child to be raised so she started having these questions and when she gave birth she decided that no, this wasn't the best situation for this child that she had had that she considered her child. Of course, the husband and wife considered the child their child. Um, and so the mother, the biological mother, the surrogate mother, decided to keep the child, wanted to maintain custody of the child. Um, the couple who had hired the surrogate mother wanted sole custody. Um, I don't know if the surrogate mother wanted sole custody or just significant custody. I can't remember the specifics. But in any event, what the two factions in the story wanted were not, uh, they, they wouldn't work together. And so there was a big lawsuit about it. And the question was, what do we think about surrogate motherhood? Uh, is this something that's a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Should it be regulated? Should the individuals do what they think is right? All these questions came up. Well, there were no statutes on this and there weren't any case law on this issue. Uh, there wasn't really any tremendously difficult technology that was being used in this situation, but for some reason no one had, had really ever thought to legislate in this area. And so what we had to, to deal with was the issue of public policy. And there were some public policies out there that applied. One public policy you could say would be in the privacy area. Um, the, the Roe v. Wade, the Griswold type cut cases that talk about um, privacy in your own biological uh, body. And so you could say that the a surrogate mother had the right to make her own choices about her body. But of course, uh, at the time that these choices were finally being made, the child had been born. The child was no longer part of the body of, of the surrogate mother. Another uh, line of cases that could be considered would be the idea of selling a baby. Um, some said, well, this was selling her own biological child. Um, uh, others said that she was performing a service for this family and that it wasn't that she was selling the baby, but she was um, uh, selling her services of nurturing the baby while the baby was inside her body. Just like you might hire a nanny to care for your child once a child is born, you're kind of hiring a nanny to care for the child before the child is born. So that's another line of thought. And um, so then you could look at, well, what about abortion? I'm not sorry, adoption uh, situations uh, where the, the woman wants to give her child up for adoption, but then she changes her mind, or maybe the woman wants to give up the child, but the biological father doesn't. You can draw comparisons to those circumstances. You could say, well, the surrogate mother had decided to give her child up, quote unquote, for adoption, but um, now she's changed her mind. So how should the rules work there? Others said, well, this really isn't a a child selling situation because the child was going to be given not to strangers but to the child's biological uh, father and to his wife and so how could a person buy their own biological child so anyway there were lots of ideas out there people had different perspectives and eventually in fact pretty quickly states passed statutes in this area some states prohibited it completely. Some states were very open and allowed it in many circumstances. Other states permitted it but regulated it significantly. But initially, when this first came into play, there weren't statutes, so what we relied upon was public policy. So many times public policy becomes important when, there, when there's a lack of statutes, a lack of cases. Many times this arises when there's a technology 
or a social uh, behavior that becomes more common um, to, 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 to look at these issues. So for example, the internet, uh, that technological advance caused there to be a need to, uh, you know, there were gaps in the law because the law had, had not considered the possibility of internet. And so for a while, when cases involving the internet were being decided, courts had to look to public policy. Um, so, so that's another example of how public policy can, can play out. Okay, so now we're, we're first of all going to talk about this, the a state or federal statute situation. And that's a little bit of a misleading term. I'm going to add and common law. To this slide. Okay, so um, obviously crimes are going to be codified in Texas. We have the Texas Penal Code, so we can look up the statutes. Let's just take a second and look at Texas statutes. It's always a good thing, I think, to use a real example. So in order to find Texas statutes, you just Google it. You type in Texas statutes. It'll be the first hit here. You go in here and I'm going to go into the Texas Penal Code. So I'm going to go into code and I'm going to scroll down until I get to the Penal Code. And I could pick any chapter I want. I'm going to pick the robbery uh, code. And this would define what's involved in robbery. And here's the actual elements. We've used that word before in contract law. What are the four elements of contracts? Well, we already know these. We need an agreement, consideration, legal capacity, and legal object. Well, guess what? Crimes all have elements too. Um, here we have a person commits an offense, meaning robbery, if in the course of committing a, a theft as defined by this. So we need to have a theft as defined by this law. That's going to be one of our elements. With the intent and with the intent to maintain or control the property. So we have our second element. And then he has to do one or the other of these third elements. So you can see how it pretty easy to break down. So this is an example of a statute. So if there is a quote unquote contract that I enter into with somebody, the purpose of which is to rob somebody else, maybe I hire somebody to uh, steal something from somebody else. Maybe that, that person who I want to, to have their house robbed has a Monet painting that I want. So I hire a cat burglar to come in and steal it. Well, that would be a robbery situation. And we could look directly to uh, a statute to see that that is prohibited, so that contract would not be enforceable. But it's not just crimes that are covered under these situations. I mean, crimes are clearly illegal behavior. But when we use the term illegal, we're not just talking about criminal behavior. Lots of other things violate the law, even if they don't raise the possibility of incarceration or, or criminal type offenses, and one would be tort. A tort, as you know, is a, uh, a harm that one person does to another, uh, such as defamation, assault, battery, a car accident case, um, uh, those are examples of torts. Torts can oftentimes also be a crime, but there are plenty of torts that are not crimes. But a tort is unlawful behavior even when it's not in cr a crime, and therefore, behavior or when, when the subject matter of a contract, put the term contract in quotes because it's really not a contract, but when the, the subject of this agreement is to commit a tort, it's going to be unenforceable. Imagine that I hired you to spread vicious rumors against somebody else. You know they're untrue. I'm hiring you to spread those rumors. Um, we might have an agreement. We might have consideration. We might both have legal capacity, but what we don't have is a legal object because we are contracting to commit a tort. If a contract is formed and then the subject of the contract becomes illegal um, under this new statute, then the contract is discharged. When I was 18, I went to college in a different state. At that time in that state, it was lawful for 18-year-olds to drink alcohol, both beer and wine and uh, liquor. Well, maybe not liquor, but I can't remember. Anyway, um, it, generally, you were allowed to drink. 
while I was in that state during my freshman year, the state legislature changed the rules. They raised the um, age for drinking to 21 for everything. They did not grandfather the people who had been allowed to drink uh, prior to that time. So literally one day it was lawful for me to drink, the next day it was unlawful for me to drink. Now imagine that I had entered into an agreement before this law change, um, under which I went to my, my local beer distributor and say, hey, I drop off a keg of beer at my dorm every Friday at 5 p.m. And um, so we entered into this contract and the beer distributor did that every Friday at 5 p.m. And I promptly paid for it. We had a lovely contract. Everybody was happy. We had all of our elements satisfied. We had an agreement. We have consideration. We both have legal capacity because I'm 18. And um, we also have a legal object. Nothing wrong at that time with an 18-year-old buying alcohol and consuming alcohol. Then this a law changes. Um, now, the contract that I entered into the beer distributor was, we'll say, for a 12-month period. But this, um, this law changes in the middle of that 12-month period, and the law was immediately effective. Well, the second that that law went into effect, my contract with the beer distributor went poof. It no longer existed because now the subject of that law, or, or the way that we would comply with that law, um, has become unlawful. Now, of course, uh, if my roommate was 21, my roommate could enter into the contract. Uh, but at that moment, the contract is discharged. No one has any continuing obligations under the contract. Now, let's imagine for a second that the beer distributor, uh, three weeks before the law changed, stopped dropping off the, the uh, kegs of beer, or they dropped off the wrong keg of beer, or they uh, didn't refrigerated the way that the contract provided or in, or some other breach. Maybe they de delivered it too late or too early or on the wrong day. Anyway, there was some problem with their performance. Um, then, of course, the law changes are the obligations under the contract are discharged going forward. I can still sue that beer company for their breach of contract back before the law changes, even though the law is now changed because the law doesn't change um, it doesn't become retroactive and make things that once were lawful at the time suddenly unlawful. Okay, so we've talked about the first category here of state and federal statutes that can cause problems. So we've talked about crimes. Most crimes are state laws, but there's some federal federal crimes like treason, um, federal income tax evasion espionage, things like that, that would be federal crimes. And we've talked about torts. Let's look at another category, contracts with unlicensed professionals. This is a, a relatively subtle area with lots of different moving pieces. So let's go over what we're talking about when we talk about this area. The first thing that makes this issue kind of complex is that there's lots of reasons why states license people. Imagine for a second that um, I decide this whole teaching at, at Collin College is not where my true interests lie. And I decide I'm going to put, I'm going to open a, a medical clinic. I'm going to put my sign up there. I'm going to advertise in the local um, newspapers and, and magazines and on the internet. And I'm going to bill myself as Cynthia Groover, MD. I buy all the equipment, I hire the receptionists and the other individuals that I need, and um, I have patients showing up to receive treatment from me. And I actually do provide services. Um, I'm a pretty smart person, we'll, we'll assume, for the sake of this uh, situation, and I've read a fair amount about the law. So the first several patients who come to see me, I give them wise advice. It's actually the same type of advice that a medical doctor might have given them. Um, one person has a head cold. I say, you know, take some ibuprofen, uh, get lots of sleep, drink lots of fluids, you'll feel better soon. That's pretty much all that a, 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 med a true medical doctor could do. Um, but as time passes, I get more complex situations, and the, the lack of medical knowledge that I have uh, begins to show. I have one uh, a patient who comes in who has a sore on his arm. 
I assume it's just an infection. So I get out some a Neosporin and put it on it and say, it'll feel better soon. Just go home and get your own Neosporin and you'll do great. But it ends up it really wasn't uh, an infected sore. It was skin cancer. And the patient takes me at my word, thinks I know what I'm talking about, and uh, does not uh, seek other medical treatment. A time passes, the cancer spreads, and my patient passes away because he or she did not receive the appropriate medical uh, care when he or she first came to see me. So we can look at that situation and say, wow, that's a pretty um, good reason why we want to have uh, people who say they're doctors actually receive a certain level of credentialization so that when that when the lay person goes to see them they know this person is an expert in this area I don't need to be an expert I can trust this other person is an expert let's imagine for a second that that patient of mine who dies from skin cancer his or her heirs sue me saying look you told my uh, my mother will say that uh, she had a skin infection. You misdiagnosed this. She, you entered into a contract with her to give her accurate medical advice, and you didn't give her accurate medical advice. And a consequence of that, consequential damages, is that she's dead now, and I'm suing you for that. So in this case, the plaintiff is suing under a contract theory. This is a little aside, but there's lots of other ways that this also could be approached. But since we're in a contract sections of the course, we're going to focus on the contract theory. Well, I might come back and say, well, that's an interesting theory you have there, but it's got a problem. There are four elements to contracts. Okay, maybe you're right that your mother, my patient, and I had a contract. And maybe you're right that consideration was pro provided. And you're likely right that we both had legal capacity. But your problem is that there was no legal object here because after all, I really wasn't a doctor. I really had no business uh, providing any kind of medical guidance. I was actually violating a state law when I did that. So under those circumstances, while there's nothing wrong with providing um, medical services when that's the subject of the contract, I was performing that illegally. And so therefore, uh, we don't have that fourth element and so therefore we don't have a contract. Well, as you can see, that's not a very satisfying answer. The, the children of the, the woman would say, wait a second, we're being victimized again. Our mom was victimized when she went to somebody whom she thought was a doctor, whom she thought was an expert in the field, whom she thought was giving good medical advice, and she didn't receive it. And now we're being victimized again by saying that somehow or another our mother was responsible for the fact that you were violating the law and hurting her. That's blaming the victim. Well, the, the, parent, this mean that the children of that patient would be correct because the reason that we require people who, who want to become doctors and nurses to have a certain credential, to uh, be licensed in that particular field, is to protect the general public. Because think how hard it would be if anyone could call themselves a doctor or a nurse, how would you and I, lay people, be able to sort through the people who truly are medical experts, who truly do deserve the title of doctor, from those individuals who are charlatans, who really don't have any expertise? It would require that each one of us do a significant amount of research, um, and many of us wouldn't know how to approach that and maybe lack the time or the resources to be successful at that. And so it makes sense to have the state step in and say, you don't have to worry about any of that. If somebody calls themselves a doctor, uh, they have met a pretty high standard of knowledge in this area. You can trust what they have to say. So these laws are designed to protect uh, the general public. That's one of the purposes of, of these types of laws. Um, That's the reason why medical doctors and nurses and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants and all the other medical specialties, phlebotomists, um, et cetera, et cetera, have to be licensed. It's also why attorneys have to be licensed. It's also why um, uh, public school teachers have to be licensed, and as it's called, a certification, but some kind of credential from the state that says this person knows enough to do this stuff, has enough expertise to do this, and also has demonstrated a good enough character that they, that he or she can do this. So sometimes that's the goal, to make sure that the general public is, is being treated appropriately.
Sometimes, though, the goal is very different. Sometimes the goal can be that the state wants to collect revenues. Think about it. My guess is most people in this class have at some point gotten a fishing license. Um, when you got the fishing license, were you asked a lot of probing questions about which type of bait you should use or how to properly remove a hook from the mouth of a fish? Were you uh, instructed about how to reduce the suffering of the fish after you've caught it? My guess is no, no, and no. The goal of licenses for the mo fishing licenses for the most part is generation of revenue. Now there is some argument that they're trying to control the fish population. In certain circumstances, it more relates not so much to fishing but to, to hunting, that some states will restrict the number of hunting licenses that are issued to ensure that, that a certain population of animal is not overhunted uh, to a, a level that isn't a, a good one for the uh, ecosystem. Um, so sometimes it's about the health of the the patients or the consumers, financial or otherwise health. Sometimes it's to control some aspect of the culture, such as the number of deer. Uh, sometimes it's for the safety of people. Uh, this can apply in the health industry. But sometimes it's just to raise income for the state. So let's imagine this scenario. Um, I am a fishing guide now. And... Uh, uh, I am on Lake Louisville and you've hired me for the day. You've gotten onto my fishing boat and we have gone around um, to various locations. I've shown you all the places that are the best to catch fish and you've caught several fishes. You've had a lot of fun. It's been a great day of, uh, you know, fishing and you have really enjoyed yourself. Um, the contract that we entered into was for six hours of fishing and those six hours have now concluded, so we're going back to um, the, the dock that uh, we initially met at so that you can go about your business. And so while, while you're unloading from, from the boat, I say, okay, um, you know, our contract price that we discussed was $100. How are you going to pay for that? And now you say, well, let me first of all say I had a wonderful time. Thank you so much. You knew all the best places to go. You had a wonderful boat to take me on. It was just a lovely, lovely experience. But before I went on this trip, I actually Googled you. And gosh, you have lots of wonderful reviews from lots of, uh, of your customers and, and really said wonderful things about you. It's one of the reasons I wanted, frankly, to, to use you as my, my guide. But I also noticed that you had never gotten gotten a fishing guide license. Um, as you may know, a fishing guide license costs twenty dollars. Uh, you just can pick one up at the Walmart and pay the pay the fee, and you're covered. But you don't have that. I, I checked the records. You, you've never made that purchase and so as a result um, our contract is null and void sure we have an agreement sure we both provided consideration sure we both have legal capacity but this contract was illegal and so therefore I have no obligation to pay you anything I think we'd all agree at this point that that's insane that you can't get a free service um, that was provided appropriately and then just not pay it because the person doesn't have a license. When the license isn't designed to protect um, the, the consumer. Now, of course, there could be another scenario, though. It could be that this fishing guide license, which, by the way, I'm making this up, so this isn't a real thing. But it could be that if the state of Texas were to roll out a fishing guide license requirement, that it might be more about boat safety. It might uh, be about requiring that fishing guides know CPR, uh, that they understand the importance of everyone wearing life vests, that they have special training in safe fishing techniques so that people won't get hooked by uh, hooks and things along those lines. And so you could imagine that there could be some safety implications to it. And under those circumstances, then you might have an ob our argument that um, the uh, fishing guide person who doesn't have a license wouldn't be able to collect a check against or to collect money against the customer. Uh, but you wouldn't be able to argue that the customer was somehow equally at fault with the fishing guide. After all, the customer shouldn't have to research his fishing guide to see if the person has the license or not. And so let's imagine a different scenario. Let's say that this time I'm the fishing guide, you and I enter into a contract uh, for me to take you out for six hours. 
were out for about uh, uh, four hours. And um, I suggest that you get into this little a canoe that's next to my boat that was attached. I said, you know, you're going to have more success uh, fishing in this canoe. Uh, it's a good experience for you to have this. So you hop onto the canoe and then I start my motor of my boat and go away. And I leave you stranded in the middle of nowhere in a canoe. You don't know where you are. You don't have cell phone reception in this place. Uh, you maybe don't even have a paddle. Um, you're not near a coast, and so you really don't know what to do under these circumstances. Um, naturally, you decide to sue me once you get back to, to a safe place. Um, and one of the theories you might advance would be suing me for breach of contract. I didn't provide the six hours of, um, of uh, the, the, the tour that I was supposed to. But if I could say, oh, wait a second, I wasn't licensed, so you know what? That contract isn't enforceable, so uh, because it wasn't enforceable, you can't sue me successfully. That would defeat the purpose of why we actually require the license in the first place. So the takeaway is sometimes a contract with a non-licensed professional is going to be enforceable, especially by the other person, and sometimes it's not going to be enforceable. Let's consider the issue of usury. We're still in the statutes here, so we're still talking about state and federal statutes. Usury is basically state law driven, and usury has to do with the highest interest rate that can be charged. In Texas, as is true in many states, it's a pretty complicated uh, set of statutes that provide for what the highest interest rates can be. It depends upon who is making or who is uh, making the loan, who is receiving the loan, how long the loan is for, uh, what the collateral, if any, is for the loan. So I can't give you a number and say anything over this is unlawful. Anything less than this is okay. It's a pretty complex area. Um, so, uh, but, but contracts over that limit, the courts are not going to enforce. What do the courts do? Well, they can do lots of things in this area. Sometimes the courts will say, um, that, that we will reform the contract. This is the, the remedy, uh, equitable remedy of reformation. We will reform the contract so that the highest lawful interest rate is being charged. So let's say the contract had said 100% per annum interest rate and the statute allows no higher than 20%. So then the uh, court might cross out the word 100 from the contract and replace it with the word 20. That's one option. That's the most advantageous for the lender. Another thing the court might do is the court might say, uh, well, we're going to remove the 100, but we're going to replace it with zero. We're going to um, not charge any interest. This is going to be retroactive to the time that the person entered into the contract. As you can see, this has a punitive aspect to it. It's designed, because uh, obviously, a lender would never lend money for zero interest. Um, there's always going to be a few people who don't pay it back, and the person's not making any money, so it's inherently a losing proposition. Uh, it's even possible that a court might say, you know what, we're not going to even require that that a lender, uh, that uh, a borrower to pay back at all. So let's say the 100% the interest rate was for a loan for $1,000. The court could say, borrower, you just got yourself a free $1,000. So you can see the court has lots of opportunities to handle this. The court's going to realize that usury laws are designed to protect borrowers. <coughs> So let's imagine that there's a scenario where there's a provision in the contract that the um, borrower wants to enforce that particular provision. That it's advantageous for the borrower. Even if the overall contract is usurious, the court would likely enforce that provision because the usury laws are designed to protect the borrower. It's not a situation where the borrower is equally at fault with the lender. Okay, let's consider gambling and Sabbath laws. In Texas, we have relatively few types of gambling that are lawful. We have some greyhound racing and some horse racing, and we have a state lottery. 
There's also a few opportunities to have raffles and bingo activities if the cause is charitable. But for the most part, most gambling is not lawful in Texas. If, uh, imagine for a second that um, in my office, I establish a, uh, a uh, March Madness uh, bracket uh, gambling situation. Uh, everybody puts $10 in, they get to submit their bracket, and at the end of March Madness, um, all of that money from everyone that participated, all that pot will go to the person who came closest to having the most correct uh, bracket. So as March is going through, people are checking the brackets every day. Oh gosh, I didn't do well this weekend. Oh, but I did great, you know, the next weekend or whatever. Anyway, so we're reaching to the final four and then the final game. Everybody's excited. There are two people in the uh, in the office who are who have uh, very good records and almost the same number of points. One wanted one to win, one wanted the other team to win. It's all going to come down to who wins that final contest. And it ends up that Bob is the big winner. So the next day after that final contest, Bob comes into the office. Everybody is cheering for Bob. Yay, Bob, what are you going to do with all that money? I mean, we might say that um, 100 people in the office participated. So there's a 1000 bucks. This is some real coin here. Um, so Bob is, of course, jubilant. Anyway, um, as the day progresses, he comes by my office. He says, and he says to me, hey, Groover. Um, I guess you saw last night that my team won, and so I guess I have the best bracket. I said, yes, you did. Congratulations. That was an amazing game. You really deserve the credit. You called this season very, very well. And he says, well, okay, thank you for the kind words. Um, I understand that there were 100 people who participated. I go, yes, you're right. There were 100 people. And Bob says, well, and I understand 100 people, each one of them paid $10 for the opportunity to participate in this. I say, yeah, that's correct. And then he says, well, and my understanding according to the rules are is that um, there is only one winner, and that winner gets 100% of that money, and that winner seems to be me, so I guess I need to, to get the $1,000 from you now. And I say, well, you're right. You, you've accurately described how this particular game was supposed to work. Um, you're also right that when you purchased the, uh, your, uh, your uh, bracket, your right to participate in the bracket for $10, that we had an agreement. And you're right that there was consideration provided. And you're also right that you have legal capacity. You're well over 18, Bob. We both know that. So there's not an issue there. But, Rob, this was illegal in Texas. Um, this was gambling. And uh, so we don't have a legal object for this for this uh, particular uh, contract. So it, it's not a contract. We're both equally at fault. I mean, we were both gambling. I was setting it up and you were participating. And honestly, Bob, you knew it was illegal, right? I mean, we all kind of knew that, right? Uh, so um, I'll, I will be keeping the $1,000. Um, I've got some home repairs to do, and so it's going to come in real handy for me. Um, and so, but again, congratulations to you. Best wishes. You did a great job with your brackets. So, as you can imagine, after I recover from my punch in the nose, I am the least popular person in the office. Everybody hates me, but I am legally right. Um, it w was gambling, and um, those contracts are unenforceable. Now, in the real world, obviously, um, uh, it would be very likely that the person would actually pay up because, well, there is some element of gambling. There's also kind of the camaraderie. And, of course, anybody who would treat their uh, coworkers so poorly is, is not going to be very successful at work. But those contracts are unenforceable. And so Bob won't be able to successfully sue me to enforce the contracts. They may be, be willing or be able to, to persuade law enforcement to prosecute me for running this type of gambling enterprise, possibly. So I may make, get my comeuppance eventually. Let's talk about the, the second category here. We've talked about gambling. Let's talk about Sabbath laws. Um, Sabbath, the, the term Sabbath is a term that you'll find in the 
in the uh, Christian and the Jewish scriptures, um, it refers to a day of rest. In the Jewish religion, this day starts at sundown on Friday and continues through sundown on Saturday. Uh, for most Christians, this uh, Sabbath is on the Sunday. It begins, I guess, at 12.01 a.m. Sunday morning and ends at 11.59 p.m. on Sunday night. And so uh, the, what, what day of the week the Sabbath is varies depending upon your particular uh, uh, religious beliefs. Um, it used to be up until about the mid 80s that uh, many states, including Texas, had a significant number of these Sabbath laws. I'll give you an example. When I was growing up, um, the malls were closed on, on Sunday. They were not open at all. You, you could buy no clothing. Of course, there wasn't the internet at this point. So, I mean, if for some reason or another you needed to buy clothing on a Sunday, you were really pretty much out of luck. Even stores like grocery stores and convenience stores were not able to sell a lot of items. I, at that time, I, had a, I was in high school um, at that time, and I had a boyfriend who worked at a Walgreens. Anyway, he sometimes worked on Sunday morning because many of these rules were actually during the times, uh, you know, kind of up to noon. So it wasn't necessarily the whole Sunday, um, although the rule about the mall was the whole Sunday. But, but the limitations of what could be bought a lot of times expired at noon. The idea historically was you ought to be at church. You ought not be buying these types of items. Or at least that was the, the, the message that the legislature wanted to send to the citizens. Anyway, when my boyfriend would be working, he would have to cordon off areas and say, ah, stuff in this aisle, we can't, buy, we can't sell to you until afternoon. And he shared with me some of the quirky rules that existed. For example, he could sell cloth diapers before noon, but he couldn't sell disposable diapers before noon. So just kind of weird, odd things along those lines. In the mid 80s, these rules were abolished by statute. Um, there really have never been meaningful um, challenges to these laws based upon um, a First Amendment or religious uh, liberty type, a religious establishment type argument. Uh, there are still a few places in the country that do have more extensive blue laws, but uh, a common myth is they were eliminated because they were held to be unconstitutional. That's not true. In Texas, though, we still have a few Sabbath rules. And the two that are, uh, that are most important, really the, the only two that are significant at all, are that car dealerships have to be closed either on Saturday or on Sunday. Um, it sounds kind of like kind of an odd rule. I mean, really? I can buy anything but a car? A car doesn't sound particularly sinful. I mean, sinful things can happen in a car, I suppose, but they aren't inherently sinful. So um, that doesn't really seem like too reasonable of a rule. Well, let's go back to the old blue laws, the ones back from the 80s. Um, many times people like to characterize those rules as um, about the, the idea that people used to be more uh, religious or more observant or more concerned about honoring uh, the religious tradition that they were in. And I'm sure that there are many people for whom that is true. But that's not really how the legislature worked. Um, the reason that we had blue laws for as long as we did wasn't have, didn't have that much to do with the piety of our legislature. It had to do more with the fact that the retail industry was a pretty significant lobby in Texas. You may say, well, why would the retail industry want to have blue laws? It limited their ability to have their stores open. If they can't open their stores, they can't sell stuff. Surely they would want to eliminate blue laws. Well, think about it. If the blue law stated you can't be open on Sunday, that meant your competitors also couldn't be open on Sunday. So anyone who needed to buy a swimsuit or a pair of jeans or a towel was going to have to buy that on Saturday or sometime during the week. It's not like people bought fewer clothes overall. They just bought them on other days. So the retail businesses didn't lose money because they were selling the same amount of stuff. They were just selling it on days other than Sunday. But being closed on Sunday allowed them to conserve some expenses. It allowed them to not air condition 
their buildings on Sundays. It allowed them to have lower staffing levels because they didn't have to staff the stores on Sunday. So they sold the same amount of stuff, but they had less overhead. So it was a win for the stores. And as long as these laws weren't in effect, they didn't have to worry about competition not complying with the laws. Now, once the blue laws were repealed in Texas, all the malls were open um, on Saturdays and Sundays. Certainly, it's true that a particular department store or, or other store could say, we're not going to be open on Sundays. For example, Chick-fil-A and Hobby Lobby have that policy. They aren't open on Sundays. So it certainly wasn't a legal requirement that businesses be open on Sundays. But if you're a retailer and you're not open on Sundays, well, people are still going to be shopping. They're going to be shopping your competition. So you will likely find that you sell less stuff. You may be saving some money because you're not having to staff your store, but some of that business you would have gotten if you had been open is going to your competitors. Well, the car dealership lobby remains very strong in Texas. So they were able to keep the blue laws in effect, even though retailers were not able to do so. The rules in Texas provide that a car dealer can choose to be closed on Saturday or Sunday. If you've ever shopped for a car, you've probably noticed that most choose to be closed on Sunday. Um, and of course, it makes sense that car dealerships would like this because after all, let's say a car dealership is open on both Saturday and Sunday. Let's say the law were changed. Does that mean people are going to buy twice as many cars or even 10% more cars? Do people think to themselves, you know what, the, the car dealership's open today. I think I'm going to make an impulse buy of a car that I had no other plans to buy and wouldn't have bought if the car dealership had been closed on that day. No, it's a big ticket item. If the car dealership is open six days a week, um, it's going to sell as many cars as it would if it were open seven days a week. But again, the car dealership gets to re uh, restrict some of the, the overhead expenses that it's going to bear. Okay, so that's the rules about the car dealerships and their rules about being open Saturday or Sunday. The other area that we see blue laws has to do with alcohol sales. Alcohol cannot be sold on Sundays before noon. Again, that's similar to those Walgreens rules that I was talking about before. Um, and this probably has more of a, um, a pious emphasis than uh, the car dealership rule. In addition, liquor stores must be closed all day on Sundays. So you can, you know, buy liquor, buy the drink, for example, in a restaurant afternoon on Sunday, but you're not going to be able to buy liquor um, any other way um, within the state of Texas on Sundays. So anyway, that's how um, the Sabbath laws work, the blue laws work. There's a, a fair amount of discussion about how we got the term blue laws for this. I'm not going to spend time on this, but I do want to flag one issue. Sometimes people think blue laws has something to do with pornography. You know, the idea that the word blue refers, you know, to something pornographic. Uh, there's no connection there. Uh, there's a lot of theories as to why it's called blue laws, and there's a lot of debate, but that's not what's going on here. So let's imagine that a car dealership breaks the rules. It's open on both Saturday and Sunday in a particular week. Um, I go to the dealership on Sunday and I buy a car. Um, and um, that car that I buy has a certain warranty associated with it. And um, I drive it off the lot. It um, doesn't work too well. So I bring it to the car dealership so that it can fix the car. Um, then um, I go back, I paid cash for the car uh, when I bought it on Sunday. I go back a few uh, days later and say, hey, how's my car doing? And they go, your car? What do you mean your car? Like, well, my car, remember I, I brought it in a few days ago because it wasn't working well. I purchased it from this lot just about a week ago on Sunday. Oh, well, it can't be your car then, can it? What do you mean? Well, it was an illegal contract, right? I mean, um, yeah, you had an agreement with our dealership. Yeah, you had consideration. Sure, you had legal capacity, but it was illegal for this car dealership to sell it to you on Sunday because it had also been open on that Saturday. So therefore, you didn't really buy the car. Um, and so it continues to be our car dealership's car. So 
uh, no, I mean, you can, you can buy it from us now. Uh, it'll be the same price that you negotiated with them before. Well, are you going to refund my money? Well, no, uh, the, 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 the contract was void. So there's no need for us to return any money to you. We would all say that's an appalling outcome. Even though this law, this Saturday or Sunday choice law, doesn't really have to do with meeting the needs of the consumers. For example, it's not really designed to provide health or safety for consumers. We still would say, well, it's the car dealership who broke the rule. I, the consumer, may not have even been aware that that particular car dealership had been opened on Saturday. I might have assumed it was closed on that Saturday. So when I came on the Sunday, um, I had assumed that it was fully compliant with the law. And obviously, under those circumstances, the court would enforce the contract, would require the car dealership to surrender the car to me because it really is my car. Okay, so we've talked about the circumstances in which a state or federal law is at issue or the common law is at issue. Now we're going to talk, by the way, this is what uh, Texas statutes look like. They're called Vernons in Texas. Um, now we're going to talk about the public policy aspects here. Okay, so we've, we've I've kind of already touched this a little bit. Uh, usually we point to a particular statute or a case to determine whether a contract is illegal and therefore unenforceable. But there is the possibility that public policy can play a role. Let's look at the definition of public policy. It arises when both the government's concern for its citizens and the beliefs people hold uh, regarding the proper subject are, are the, and the beliefs people hold regarding the proper subject of business transactions. The focus is on what is in society's best interest. And the courts are likely to find that such contracts that violate public policy are unenforceable. Okay, so let's talk about contracts and restraints of trade. We actually in the state of Texas have a statute in this area, so we don't really rely upon public policy in the same way that we would if we had no statute. But there are states who don't have a statute in this area, and so they would rely upon the public policy. Certainly the statute that we have in Texas, um, uh, as our legislature should always do, they should look to well, what is the public policy, you know, as they're passing a law, what, what, are, what are the interests that are going, what law is going to be in our society's best interest. So uh, when laws are passed, they should be um, in the public interest. So let's consider for a second the idea of contracts and restraint of trade. You know, our economy is established based upon the idea that the free enterprise system is very socially useful. If there are uh, five car washes in town, um, all providing exactly the same service, um, and one charges $15, and one charges $13, and one charges $11, and one charges $9, and one charges $7, guess where the lines will be, right? They'll be at the $7 place. Um, that will, that's the, the best deal for the money. And over time, what would likely happen is that the ones that charge more than $7 will think to themselves, hmm, we're not getting too many clients here. Maybe we ought to lower our price. And so some of those uh, dealer, uh, some of those car, car wash places would probably lower their amount of, of charge or maybe add additional services, provide a better service uh, to distinguish themselves from their competitors. And so uh, that's, again, how the free enterprise system works. That's a, a, a good thing for consumers. Consumers are going to get the best value. But let's imagine a different scenario. We had these five car washes, all with different price points. Uh, one of these five car wash owners are all owned separately says thinks to himself, you know what? I've got some cash here. I'm going to buy up all of my competitors. So he uh, will say he's the one who charges $11 an hour. He buys the one who charges 13. He buys the one charging 15. He buys the one charging nine. He buys the one charging seven. He owns all of the car wash places. And let's assume this is a small town. Not I guess that small since it's five car washes, but kind of small in the middle of nowhere. So really, there aren't a lot of places to get your car washed outside of the city limits unless you want to get out a hose in your driveway and wash your car yourself. Okay, so once he gets these five car washes, is he going to keep that same price structure? 
No, he is almost certain to rise the $7 price higher. Now, of course, he does face the fact that there will be people who were willing to pay for a $7 car wash who will decide with the car washes offered at $11, they may decide, I'll wash my car myself, or I'll just have a dirty car, or I'll wash my car less often. So there will be there will be some differences in demand based upon that. But um, he's not competing against himself. He's going to be able to um, establish a price point, maybe at $13, maybe at $15, where he is able to maximize his profits because there is no true competition. That would be an example of a restraint in trade. Let's imagine instead of our, our uh, $11 a car wash uh, person, instead of him uh, buying up his competitors, he did something different. He said he invited all of his competitors over to his house for a barbecue. And as they're enjoying ribs and brisket, he says to them, you know what? Why don't we all charge $13 a car wash? We'll all make more money. This will be great. And all of the people um, at, at this gathering say, yeah, that sounds great. And so they all go back to their uh, uh, car wash places and change their signs. And now they're all charging $15 a car wash. Uh, yes, there's a few people who decide not to get their car wash, but uh, maybe there's a 10 or 20% chance of dropping demand. But almost all the car washes are earning significantly more money as a result. So that would be an agreement in restraint to trade. And you can see how that may be really good for the car wash business, but not so good for consumers who want their car washed. So these are perceived of as against public policy. There are actually antitrust laws that apply in this area in some cases. Um, antitrust laws exist upon the, at the state and federal level, and there are also case law outside of the actual statutes that, led, that, that control this area as well. Let's look at a particular type of a contract in restraint of trade. This is a little different than the example I just used. Imagine this time that I have a hair salon. Um, I um, am just opening my business and I happen to have, we'll say, 10 chairs uh, so I can hire 10 stylists. And so I do hire 10 stylists. Um, and in fact, all of the stylists that I hire are straight from beauty school. They don't have any books. And by books, I mean they don't have any following at this point. I mean, they may have some family members and friends who um, are, are interested in getting their hair cut, but they don't have any established customer base of any significant size. So anyway, they're all excited to be here on their first day of work. We open up the store and we start having customers and um, we assign a hairstylists to customers in kind of a rotating basis. Uh, when you're in the first chair, you get the first customer of the day, the second chair, because second customer of the day and so forth, that round robin. So some of the, the stylists are really good and they do a wonderful job, very good at customer satisfaction. And so those uh, stylists are able to develop a relationship with their clients. So when that client comes back in six weeks or eight weeks, they don't say, I want to have anybody cut my hair. They say, I want Bob or I want Sally to cut my hair. And so the, the best styles over time will develop this following, this book of business that they will have developed as a result of this, uh, this business. Okay, so that's how this, this is going, um, how, how the business model is going. Now, obviously, there could be other stylists who aren't that good, either because they're technically not as good um, cutting the hair, or perhaps they just aren't as good on the social level. They don't cultivate the relationship in the same way that um, other, uh, the other stylists do. Well, I continued on this business, and I noticed that some of my best stylists, some of my most profitable stylists, really seem to be getting quite a following. Um, I actually have one of my best stylists quit. And I see that he went across the street to a different salon. And I noticed that a lot of his customers followed him to that other salon. I don't want that to happen. I have several other good stylists, and I definitely don't want to lose their business. So I have a meeting with my remaining nine stylists, and I say, listen, um, stylists, thank you for your service. Um, I'm 
pleased to have you as my employees and I know that you're doing a good job serving our customers. Thank you for all of your hard work. Um, I have a non-compete agreement that I want you to sign. In this agreement, you agree not to work for any competitor cutting or styling hair um, for um, a year after you leave my place of employment, this place of employment. Um, so one of the, the best stylists that I have raises his hand at this point and goes, well, Groover, um, I don't want to sign that. I'm actually negotiating with another salon to leave right now. So I'm not interested in signing that. And I say, well, you know, that's your right. You don't have to sign this, but I don't have a position for you unless you choose to sign this. And at this moment, that, that, that uh, a stylist gathers up his stuff together, walks out the door. We don't see him again. Another style says, well, um, I don't really want to sign this either, but I need a job. I mean, my rent's due in, in a week, and um, I really need a paycheck, so I'm going to sign it. And in fact, all of the other stylists eventually decide to, stop, to sign it, I mean, to sign the agreement. So I have eight non-competes signed. I hired two more stylists. They signed the non-competes on their first day. So all 10 of my employees have non-competes. Prior to the non-compete, the stylist got to keep half of whatever they brought in. So if they performed a service that was uh, priced at $24, they got to keep 12, I kept 12. They also got to keep all of their tips. Um, that was a system that we had. Um, about a month after everyone signs a non-compete, I have another meeting of my uh, employees and I say to them um, we're gonna have a new uh, structure here uh, going forward um, you are going to get 25% of your whatever you bring into the salon so if um, for example you perform a $24 service you will keep six dollars and I will uh, have the $18 you'll still be able to keep all of your tips well all the salon stylists are outraged. You can't do that. That's a dramatic, that's a 50% reduction in our pay. We won't be able to make ends meet. They go, well, I know it's going to be tough, but that's the deal. If you want to resign, you certainly can do so. So um, uh, Maria, one of our stylists says, well, I'm resigning. I go, okay, uh, thank you for letting me know. We wish you the best of luck. Oh, and by the way, remember that you have that non-compete agreement, so you won't be able to work in this industry for a year. You'll need to, you know, develop another job, but, you know, in, in 12 months, you can go back to styling hair somewhere else. He's like, what do you mean? Uh, that, that applies in this situation, but, but I'm, I, it's not that I want to leave. You, you've changed the, the, the fee structure. You've changed how you, you run the business. I didn't know you were going to do that. So yeah, I realize you didn't know that, but um, that there's nothing in the contract that says I have to offer the same pay structure that I did before. So Maria reluctantly says, well, I guess I have to stick around. Um, I don't really have another skill that I would be able to use in the marketplace as effectively as my hairstyle skill. I love it. I, it's what I want to do. So I guess I have to stay here. And in fact, all the other stylists decide to stay. About a month later, um, I am going through the records and I see that my stylist named Bob um, broke a rule. He uh, uh, was supposed to keep the salon open to closing until 9 p.m. And I see that he actually clocked out at 8.53 p.m. that particular evening. I've never really liked Bob too much. And so I look at this and go, ah, oh, this is my perfect excuse to fire Bob. So I call Bob and I say, Bob, um, I got something got to show you. I see that the other day you actually closed the store at 8.53 p.m. Is that true? And Bob goes, yes, I did. Um, my last customer that I had seen, I had actually completed by 8.20. I was just sitting around there and by 8.53, there was no possibility that someone was going to come by at that point. We close at 9. It takes more than seven minutes to cut hair. So I felt it was fine for me to go ahead and close a few minutes early, especially since I wasn't earning any money. 
I say, well, I, I appreciate your honesty, um, but I can't accept that kind of behavior. And so I'm firing you. What? You're firing me for doing that once? Surely I get a warning. No, I'm, I'm firing you. Wow. Well, uh, okay. And I just want to remind you that you're still under the terms of the non-compete, so you won't be able... Wait a second. I'm not resigning here. You're firing. I mean, I would stay if you would let me. Well, the non-compete doesn't have an exception for termination situations. Um, it applies no matter the reason that you left the, my employment. You are bound by that for a year afterwards. As you can see in these examples, you can see how covenants not to compete, also called non-competes, um, can be uh, unfair to workers. It can cause workers to accept disadvantageous employment conditions because essentially that employer has a monopoly power over those employees once the employee signs a non-compete. So you may be thinking to yourself, well, why does any state allow these types of non-competes? Well, there's good arguments in favor of them, especially in certain circumstances. Let's go back to the example that we have of the styling salon. You may recall when I started this story, I said that I hired people directly from beauty school. They had no following whatsoever. And we talked about how, I guess it was Larry, he left my employee after uh, several months and he took his customers with him to this other salon. But really, were they his customers? I mean, all of his customers were people who chose to come to my salon. Yes, he cultivated a relationship with them, but he did it as my employee. And so for him to then take those customers, uh, communicate with them, maybe through email, maybe telephone calls, maybe secretly telling them in the salon, hey, I'm about to move across the street. Don't go here anymore. Go over there. Basically, what Larry did was stole my customers from me and give those to the other business. And so I did have a legitimate interest in protecting that customer list. That customer list was my goodwill and it was taken from me. And I had an economic interest in maintaining that. And so that's the, the counter argument. Let's consider another scenario. We're moving from the salon business to the high tech business. Um, I am a, uh, uh, a, a cell phone manufacturer, and so I have uh, hired a team of electrical engineers to develop a new type of circuit, and this circuit is going to dramatically increase the ability of cell phones to um, pick up uh, uh, the signal, the, the radio signal. I guess the radio signal, whatever it is, whatever signal it is. I, I obviously I don't know the technology, but um, and so what's going to happen is where other um, cell phones won't be able to get reception far from a cell phone tower, this new cell phone will be able to get reception. So you'll be able to get reception, for example, when you're in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico or whatever. And really, this phone should only be slightly more expensive than your standard cell phone. Our electrical engineers have been working on this for some time. We've kept it tightly under wraps because we know that once this gets out, our competitors are going to try to uh, copy this technology as soon as possible. And so we want to maintain our advantage to the extent that we, we can do so. So we think that we're about a year from market. And we actually have a team of 20 electrical engineers who are working um, on this project the most. And obviously, in order to develop this technology, there's a lot of discussions between the 20. They'll brainstorm different problems and how we might solve them. There's a free flow of ideas back and forth. Anyway, we had hired a new guy about three or four months ago. He was smart, came from a competitor, actually he came straight from school. And um, he came aboard and he, he's been a good contributor. He's asked a lot of good questions. He's come up with a lot of good ideas. He's listened carefully. He really knows what our plans are. He's a, an expert in what we're doing in this area, really. Anyway, he said he um, has been here for three or four months. He comes in to see me one day and he says, hey, uh, Bob, I've really enjoyed this job. It's, it's, I've learned so much. And I've worked with such great people. 
um, and have really just grown professionally. I want to thank you for this tremendous opportunity. Unfortunately, I've decided to move on to another opportunity, um, but I did want to reach out to you and tell you how much I appreciate it. I say, oh, well, uh, Bob, uh, where are you going? Well, I'm going across the street. I'm going to your main competitor, uh, that cell phone company across the street. Um, they have been recruiting me. And um, right here, I, I, you've been paying me $80,000. They're willing to pay me $160,000. Uh, you know, how can I turn that down? Um, so I've, I've said yes, and I'll be starting there on Monday. Well, what are you going to do for them? Oh, same thing I do here. In fact, um, they have a, they've just developed a unit very similar to ours. I think they heard that we were developing this product, and uh, I think they're trying to, set, to hire all of your folks away, to be honest. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if some other folks come, come in these next few days. What? You're, you're, you're going to go over there and basically tell them everything that we've developed? Well, I mean, they're my employer. They're paying me good money to know what I know, and that's what I know. So as a result, of, let's say Bob is the only one who leaves. The other uh, 19 stay on and are loyal to me. But Bob uh, really knows kind of everything there is to know. And so the other company is able to get up to speed very, very fast. Our product hits the marketplace at the 12-month point, but their product hits at the 13-month point, just a month after our product. Yes, we have a month of being able to be the only product out there, but uh, that is very short-lived. And so Bob was able to use those trade secrets, those secret information that he had gotten uh, from me or from our business in his next employment. And we all say, well, that's not right. I mean, if you've developed technology, if you've invested in research and development, you ought to be able to keep that within the, the folds of your company. And so that's a major reason for non-compete. So the customer list that we saw with the salon is a major reason where, why courts allow um, them to be enforced. And then another is a trade secrets, patents, technology, things along those lines. In the examples that we've talked about, we've talked about employment non-competes. And this is the, the one that's probably the more controversial of the two. But there are other types of non-competes, and those have to do typically with the selling of a business. Imagine that I have a, I open up a, a crepe restaurant. Um, and I have a, a family recipe for the lightest, the fluffiest, the crispiest, the most delicious crepes ever. And so that's the recipe that we use in our crepe restaurant. We have savory crepes, we have dessert crepes, we have it all. We're open from 6 a.m. at night to 8 p.m., excuse me, 6 a.m. in the morning to 8 p.m. at night. And uh, everyone loves the crepes. I mean, we have tremendous response from our customer base. Um, lots of people travel far distances so they can eat our lovely, lovely crepes. It's a wonderful uh, following that we have. Um, Bob is looking to start a new restaurant. He's owned several restaurants over the years, and he's decided that he's wanting to go into this particular market. So he's done his due diligence. He's researched the various restaurants around. He's decided he wants to buy one that already exists. And so he uh, goes to several businesses and uh, finds out about them. Anyway, he eventually comes to my business and says, hey, Groovy, are you willing to sell your business? I say, you know what? Um, yeah, I am. I, I, I would enjoy getting a little bit of cash here. That would be nice. And so Bob says, well, you know, I, I'd like to buy, um, you know, your stuff, your, your equipment, your tables. Um, I'd like to take up your lease. But I also want your goodwill. So I'd like the ability to keep the name of your business. You call it Groover's Crepes. I know a lot of people come just because they know Groover's Crepes. And so um, I'd be willing to pay you more than just the value of your stuff. I'm willing to pay you for your, um, your, your goodwill, the reputation you have in the community. Anyway, we negotiate a price. And we decide that um, the restaurant will switch over to um, be owned by Bob the following Monday. My employees are eligible to stay and most of them choose to do so. Um, Monday morning, the store opens and um, I'm going to pause, I'm going to end the lecture at this point. Um, we'll pick up in lecture number three. Thanks for your attention and we'll see you soon.